I'm Gordon Stanick. I'm with Shamrock Foods. I'm the center of the plate meat specialist. Um, I've actually found a way to make a living staying in the food business my whole life. Um, culinary by trade. Uh, Jackson and I have worked together over the years with the ACF. Let's stop for a second. Yes. Where, where were you out of high school or college? <clears throat> um, where was I? Yeah, I mean, working-wise. Um, I was working in the restaurant business. Um, I, I, I don't recall exactly where I was. That's quite, we probably, that, that's <laughs> too much information for us. We really right. don't want to know all the details. But, but a real quick side note. Um, number one, I sent a blast email to my students regarding the Board of Health, Bob McDonald. He came to visit us early on, and they're looking to hire four people. And... Uh, uh, applications were due today, they're starting you off at $50,000 with the Board of Health. You don't even have to have been graduated at a Metro State uh, to, to get a job like that. Uh, Gordon is very atypical of what a lot of us will uh, aspire to do. We're going to get, right now, we're probably working nights, weekends, and holidays if we are in the restaurant business or the hotel business. Uh, that continues, but you know, after a while, nights, weekends, and holidays, when you get married and the kids come along, it's not as much fun as it used to be. It, it's kind of like John Elway. You don't you don't have to throw the ball every day to be have a job. Yes, so. exactly. So a lot of the people that are in the industry, a lot of ex chefs that we know, they all transition into sales or they get into another management type of a job, like the Board of Health, working for uh, environmental health. Healthcare weekends off. So I mean, a lot of uh, chefs are now at at, hold, at hospitals. Um, I just was down in Colorado Springs last week. I had a prime rib sandwich at a hospital for lunch. Yeah. Who, who would have thought that? Hey, when I was an executive chef at Rose Medical Center, they encouraged me not to work weekends. They only wanted me there Monday through Friday. So, so anyway, looking down the road into the future, um, a lot of people that start off in the restaurant industry, they pick up a skill set that is very valuable that can be translated into sales. And then once we're in sales and uh, uh, potential uh, commissions on sales kicks in uh, and different other incentives. Correct. Okay. So, so I guess long story short, you can make a living staying in the food business, which is kind of cool. Who wants to be in the food business and make money? Okay. Quite a few of you. So, so anyhow, if you have a question, please raise your hand or yell or ask. And, you know, this is definitely a participation class. Um, I like it when people talk. I'm glad to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm hoping to give you a couple of tidbits of information. And, and again, uh, I talk about current events. I have some current event issues to talk about. And, and you know, I always tell everybody, let's open our eyes. Let's ask questions. Let's say, well, why are we doing this? Because I think if you don't uh, ask questions, you'll never get an answer. Does that make sense? And if I do see you texting, I will ask you a question just to warn you right now. So anybody texting, Watch out. You will be getting a question asked at you. So anyhow, thank you for not doing that. Um, anyhow, my introduction, Jackson said it. I've gone back a few years. Um, I want to talk about the grades. Does anybody understand grading in the, in the meat industry, beef industry? Anybody understand it at all? Does anybody have a clue? Uh, uh, who's the biggest driver of beef, retail or food service? Incorrect. You would think it would be food service, wouldn't you? Guess what it really is? Retail. Okay, they buy the most beef 30 plus years ago. They started genetically modifying the animals to make them more leaner. Hogs were leaner, beef were leaner because the typical consumer, the housewife back then, as it was called, wanted leaner meats and leaner cuts for her family. Well, what does leaner mean to us as a culinarians? What does leaner mean? It's one word, it starts with a D. No, let's start with a D. Like you put it in a, on a, you know, you do laundry, you put it into the dryer, it makes them drier, less, less fat between the tissue, which means tougher meats, okay? It is what it is. That's part of the science of it. And I think if you understand the science, the basic science of this animals, then you can better grab a steak at King Supers, okay? The little mat, the little uh, white marbling, or we call it light fat between the, the muscle, inner muscle. Is, is marbling, not the external fat, but the internal fat. So marbling is a good word. That should be on the test, right, Jackson? Okay. So, so marbling gives you two things, right? A little bit of tenderness, a little bit of flavor. 
All right, what else do you need to have a good piece of meat? What's really essential for tenderness and flavor? Does anybody have a clue? If you want a good, tender, flavorful steak, besides having a good quality steak, what do you need? Okay, aging. So you take beef and you age it. How important is that? I mean, if you have a steak that isn't aged, uh, it would be very tough, very chewy, okay? Retail, for example, doesn't really age their beef because they don't have the space to do so. So therefore, when you get a steak at King Supers, it looks pretty good, but guess what? The flavor and tenderness is not quite there. Has anybody had that experience from King Supers or Safeway or any of those guys? Retail? I'm not, I'm not pointing anybody fingers at anybody. They're all about the same. So, so that's a main, main characteristic. It, it's post rigor modus. It's controlled rotting, if you want. Does that make sense? Does that catch your eye? Post rotting. We're, we're, we're controlling the rotting of the meat to a point we want to get it right to the point where it's not sour, but we don't want it fresh cut. Does everybody understand that? So we're going from here to here. You want to stay kind of over here. If you get too far, what happens? It turns sour or tastes bad, right? So, so you don't want that, do you? No. So there's a fine line of what you do. Basically, you're aging meat either um, in a cooler, 36 degrees, approximate temperature. And there's two types of aging. Um, have you been to... A, uh, Walmart has seen a whole subprimal or a big chunk of meat. That's in a cryovac. So that would be wet aging. W why is everybody wet aging nowadays? Does anybody have a clue? Why, why are you wet aging? Why do people wet age? And, and what's the other method of aging? Dry age? Has anybody heard of dry age? Okay, dry age is actually almost an old terminology because of cost. So when you take a piece of meat, let's say a ribeye, and you have it in a cryovac, and you age it for, say, 30 days, you lose a little bit of blood in the purge. Okay, does everybody understand purge? Meat will purge part of the moisture out of the muscle. Purge, okay? The longer it sits, probably the more purge. If you freeze it and then slack it out, you have even more purge. Does that make sense? Okay, so, so um, um, aging... Um, controlled aging, and then there's dry aging. So you take it out of the cryovac, you let it sit on a rack, and you basically let the muscle dry out. Does anybody have any idea how much moisture leaves that muscle? What percent leaves the muscle once you dry age it? Take a guess here. Anybody? 30? Who else? Okay, what else? Fit, how much? 50? A little bit less, we're looking about 15 to 20% will leave the muscle. So if you have two ribeyes together, one's in a cryovac wet age, think about money. Let's pretend like you're the owner of the store, okay? And this one weighs 10 pounds. You bought it, it weighs 10 pounds, it still weighs 10 pounds, it's in a cryovac, right? You take this one, you open it up, and now you let it sit on a rack, now it weighs how much when it's done after 30 days? How much does it weigh now? Give me, a, give me a math here. About eight and a half pounds. Correct. So you lost that in the air. Does that make sense? Now you paid the same amount of money for these two. Which one costs more? Right here, right? Does everybody understand that? And, and, and it, it has a nice flavor to it. It gets really kind of nutty, it, more intense, because when you take the moisture out, what happens? You get more of a beef flavor. It's kind of like raw beef jerky. That's kind of how I think of it. Question? I'm going to team teach with you if you don't mind. So, when we go to King Supers or Safeway and we see that they've got these New York steaks cut, they're nice and red and shiny, when was that meat harvested? Most likely, um, and I worked for King Supers for about seven years. Um, I worked in the meat department. Um, basically, what they do is they buy the meat that has been basically harvested at the facility. Um, has anybody been to a slaughterhouse? Cool, cool. Um, they, sit on a, they sit for one day, and then they cut them up into subprimals and send them to the store. So they probably have three days from the time of kill. Uh, we call it harvested now. We don't use the word kill that often, okay? Even though these little guys have a good life, 
They only have one bad day. Some of you will get that tomorrow. Okay. Um, anyhow, so, so they're harvested, cryovac, sent to the stores, and probably another two or three days later, they're sent to the distribution channel and then cut up into steaks. Okay, so, so maybe a week. So, so the transition, so now we're talking fresh meat. Correct. Okay. So King Supers puts an order in. Literally, everything is, is, uh, is processed and delivered so that the steaks that you're buying were literally on the hoof six days earlier. Correct. Okay. So then, because of that, they're moving things quickly, um, and that's probably the most economical way to buy beef. Uh, yeah. And if I was King Supers, for example, uh, I'm just using them as an example, to, to have all the meat that they need to uh, slice into steaks, I would have to take this whole field here and build a big warehouse five uh, pallets high and have meat in the boxes aging because that's how much space you'd need for 30 days. Do you understand the difference between six days of aging versus 30? If you're a King Supers with 75 stores, how much meat per store that would be? Do some math in your head. It would be enormous amount of warehouse that, that costs money. Well, so. I want to reflect on our experience with Buckhead Beef, okay. where uh, they specialize in dry aging, uh, wet aging of meat. Correct. Okay. So consider this. So uh, New York steaks and ribeyes and tenderloins are harvested. They're cryovac. What does that mean? Cryovac is basically taking the air out of the packaging so it allows an extended shelf life. Okay. We're going to take all that meat. We're going to put it to rest. Okay. For 30 days. Right. Okay. So when we want to buy aged meat, it's more expensive because they had to sit on that product for 30 days and you have to help pay the rent. That really is what that boils down to. Correct. When we take a look at, if you have the opportunity to go to Whole Foods in the meat department, behind the, the butcher's counter, they dry age all their beef. Tony's, Tony's is- And uh, Tony's oh, does that well. Right. It looks like, it really does look like it's rotting away in the refrigerator. It's controlled rot. That's really what it controlled is. Controlled rotting. I yeah. use that word a lot because it is. Yeah. So in other words, when, when uh, Whole Foods buys that fresh product, they take it out of the cryovac, they're gonna put it to sleep on the shelf for 30 days at least yeah, because they wanted to decompose. And the decomposition is what makes steaks tender. So we can decompose in a wet process, or we can decompose in a dry process. Right. Okay. Um, how about this? Anybody here a Scotch drinker? TJ, thank you. TJ, what is the difference when we purchase um, uh, a, uh, what's, do you know the price difference between Johnny Walker Red and Johnny Walker Blue. What's that? A couple hundred dollars more a bottle. It's a couple of hundred dollars more a bottle. Why is that? Um, what is when we see Johnny Walker Blue? What does that mean? The well, blue, I think, is a single bottle, which is one kind of just one distillation of certain specific, and then the red was a blend of several different scotch. But the but the uh, but the blue is aged. Longer. It's aged for twenty five years. So what Johnny Walker, uh, the Johnny Walker Scotch Company does, they make their scotch. They put it in probably oak barrels. They put it asleep for twenty four years. Then they will bottle it and sell it. But it's more expensive because why it's been sitting there. The ultimate end user has to help pay the rent. Exactly. That's exactly what that is. So whether we're talking about aged scotch or aged beef or an aged car, what about an old classic car? It's been around for a long time, but you know, they may be more expensive than the new cars. Right. Correct. And, and part of the science of it is, is that the, the bacteria is actually decomposing the muscle. Okay. So it's eating away and making it more tender. That's so that's part of the science of it. Clear that up. Okay, so everybody understand aging, why it's important. So don't go too far, because then, you know, it's rotten. You could age it and put it outside at 80 degrees, and you'll age it real fast, okay? So you don't want to do that either, right? So we want to do a controlled aging. Um, grades. Does everybody understand the grades of beef? 
there's, there's basically in U.S., there is USDA Prime. Right below Prime, which we have in food service, I, I use this to kind of give you a diagram. Less than 2% of all the animals harvested today are Prime. So that means if we're 100 cattle right here, how many are going to grade out Prime right now? Two. So, so it's about that big of a category, guys. See that? So then you have upper choice touches the grading scale of Prime. So right below Prime is upper choice, which is highly marbled product. Look at a helicopter. Um, and, and then what touches upper choice is choice category, okay, which you're seeing at some re a lot of restaurants and some retail. And then you have select, which touches, and then no roll, which basically has little to no marbling. Um, it, uh, upper choice is probably 18%. The choice category is probably 30 Two, and then the select category is probably another 32. And then you got no roll, approximately. That's a good question. And it, it varies, though, okay, so much. It depends on the climate, the time of year, how hot it is. Uh, you ever notice when you're out, it's 110 degrees, you really don't feel like a big meal. You feel like a salad and a beer. So do cattle. So do cattle. Because they're hot. They're not eating as much. So the time of the year, um, I'll talk about um, a little current event. Meeting Place magazine had a big article, front page, drug problem. Okay? Not, not, not humans. We're not talking about human drug problem. We're talking about cattle drug problem. How can cattle have a drug problem? Is that bizarre? I, I think it's bizarre. Anybody else think it's bizarre? Cattle have drug problems? Okay. Let, let's, let's at least get some humor out of this. Um, well, now they do. You, you can get Zilmax. Um, does anybody have, I mean, this is a tough one, but I'll ask it. Does anybody have any clue what Zilmax is? Nobody. Okay. The, the, the industry doesn't really tell you all its dirty secrets. I think there's every industry out there that has dirty little secrets. Not, not to mention our politicians, okay? Forget about that. All right? I'm not going to go there. They're all, they're all bad. But, but anyhow, we all have dirty little secrets that I think that uh, with the internet, they're being more exposed uh, at, a, at a more rapid pace. And I think it's good to talk about this. What Zilmax does, it's a beta agonist. Beta agonist. And what it does is when they eat it with the feed on the last 120 days of their life, which is when they marble up, uh, most animals are, are, are given a lot of rich corn and barley and alfalfa to make themselves bigger and marble up. So when the animal hits the feedlot, which is what we're doing here, um, he then becomes marbled. They, they walk in the door, no roll or worse, and then they eat the corn, which is sugar, right? Corn is sweet. Uh, they eat feed corn, and they marble up. Okay, so they, they get this nice marbling. Um, uh, let's stop there, uh, since we've been on the ranch. Yeah. So they're, they could be uh, free grazing, they can be whatever, but once they're, once they're gathered up for market, they really don't go to market, they go to a feedlot. Right. Where, where they're pretty much kept idle, and the main objective there is to get more pounds on them. You have three participants raising cattle. You have a rancher, okay? That's one. So food to table, let's talk about that, because everybody's talking about it like it's something new. Food at table is what you eat every day. Okay, you have a rancher, right? Then you have a feedlot. So it goes from birth to, to feedlot. Then from the feedlot, it goes to the slaughterhouse, which is your JBS, Swift, Cargill, Tyson, etc. So there's your three players in the beef industry. The common uh, thread is that only one of these guys ever make money at the same time. Two are, two are always losing money, one's making money. So... Go figure the business out. Is that a scary business to be in when you're talking about big dollars? Cattle are expensive little animals, okay? It's a two-year turnaround from the next harvest. It takes 24 months, basically, to harvest an animal, plus nine months of gestation. So you got almost three years to really start from birth to box, as we call it. Birth to box is almost three years. Chickens, does anybody know how long a chicken's life is? 
Any guesses? Come on, guess. Chickens. Eight weeks. Less. Six. Who said six? Raise your hand. Six. Six weeks. That's not a long life, man. You better be having some fun out there because that is short, okay? Six weeks. So you can turn around. If you've got a disease problem, you've got issues, you can turn around that industry pretty quick. With beef and cattle, when you have a drought in Oklahoma a couple of years ago, what happened? If you're a rancher, I'm going to pick on somebody. What's your name? Stephanie's a rancher. She's in Oklahoma, okay? You're a rancher. Put your mindset there. You own all these cattle, let's say 1,000 head. You've got an investment of $1,000 each. Make it simple, okay? So, so you've got a bunch of money in these little guys. You, you have no rain. Your fields are all dried up. You have to go buy alfalfa just to keep them alive and go get a water truck to keep them alive. Now you're spending cash. Instead of having your ranch feed these animals in your little pond, which is all dried up, you got to go buy food and water, okay? How do you feel about that, Steph? Sad. How's your checkbook looking? Bad. Now, what does Stephanie decide to do? It's her money, right? So you say, i got to get rid of these little guys. Unfortunately, it's the way it is, right? See ya. So she harvests her animals, okay? The forecast looks like no rain again. Steph, do you, do you go ahead and rebirth these animals and have more animals? At your, at your ranch, when you have no grass to feed them? What'd she say? No. Smart. She says no. Why does she say no? Because she doesn't want to, she, she want to lose money. You'll be losing money every animal you harvest. Even though you're getting $1,000 a head, you're going to lose money to raise that animal from, from, from birth to box. So Stephanie's out of the ranching, out of the cattle business, aren't you? You're going to go raise, I don't know what you're going to do. You're, you're pretty much, you're, you're in sad shape there. Okay, so, so the drought has now made Stephanie pretty darn broke. Does everybody follow that? That's true economics. Do people really think about that when they go to McDonald's and they go, give me two uh, Big Macs? They don't think about you, Stephanie, do they? Of course not. Okay, am I making a good point here? So, so there's a lot of people that takes from start to finish to get you that McDonald's Big Mac or whatever, all right? A lot of people, okay? Um, so Zilmax, what that does, when they're on feed and eating, it's a, it's a drug. And what it does, it sends a little, uh, numbs their nerves to their stomachs so they don't know they're full. Okay? It's like, kind of like drinking beer until you throw up. But they don't throw up. Okay? They just keep eating and eating and eating. Uh, anybody heard of Temple Grandin? Saw that movie? What was the movie called? Does anybody know Temple Grandin? She's a, it was a, just called Temple Grandin. I think it was. And um, she's a, a, basically an animal activist. She works up at CSU, and she does a lot of work for all the major packing houses, Swift, Tyson, Cargill, uh, all the hog people, Smithfield. And what she does, she actually took a ride in a truck with all these animals. She walked through the pens saw how they were reacting, got to sense their feelings and their stress, and, and made a lot of different changes in the industry. For example, cattle do not like to be cornered. When they go down the chute and they got to make a left turn, freaks them out. She made round corners, okay? So she did a lot of little things like that and realized that transporting these animals was also not good because they get too stressed. I mean, can you imagine... When you know you're going to be slaughtered, how would you feel? Not good, probably. You'd be a little stressed out, huh, Steph? Stephanie's stressed out. Okay, I don't blame her. Um, so she did a little study on this and said, well, this is probably not good. The animals are sluggish, and they're having some issues. And so they've kind of started to stop using it. Tyson was one of the first to stop using it. Question? I'm sorry? What does the stress do? We're not sure. Um, good question. Because of the study, even though it's been approved approximately seven years ago by the FDA, um, basically, we don't know. Again, who got it approved? Let's just take a wild guess here. I'm not sure exactly, but let me guess. Who do you think promoted that drug to get approved? The rancher, the feedlot, or the, or the slaughterhouse? 
No, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say the, I'm gonna say I'm gonna say the feedlot because if you can get more mass, you can get more money. So I'm gonna say that those feedlot guys said, "How can I get more out of my investment?" Um, let's go backwards for a second. Stephanie has a thousand head of cattle. Okay, she's gonna sell them to a feedlot for a thousand dollars a head. Correct. Okay, so a thousand times a thousand is a million dollars. Right. Okay? The feedlot is going to pack on the pounds. Right. They hope to sell them for $1,400 a head. Correct. So that's how the money is made. So you just get them to the point where they're 24 years old and or 24 months, months old right. and say bye-bye off the college or whatever. Yep. You get your money, but then there's more money to be made. Yep. And that's where the feedlot comes into play. So right. the feedlot has a further investment. You've got water, you've got alfalfa, you've got grain that they're eating. But then the feedlot, they're giving them molasses and corn and, uh, and all the good stuff to pack on the pounds. Pack on the pounds and pack on the marbling. So it's pounds and marbling. Okay, the ribeye, on the ribeye, right here, the ribeye. Anybody have prime rib or ribeye steak? They made that one inch bigger now. One inch with Zilmax, okay? Now, now we got to think about this whole process, okay? If, if that's what the industry did years ago, how many people do you think walking around Denver know that Zilmax has been in their cattle for the last, say, seven, eight years? How many? Zero. I, I saw a zero in the back row there. Thank you. Probably a point something, something, something one. Because they don't talk about it, right? I've known about it because I'm in the meat industry. I don't agree with it personally. Um, I, I'm not very fond of growth homo, hormones. I, I think you do sometimes need antibiotics so you don't kill Stephanie's cattle. Because Stephanie doesn't want, you don't want a dead guy, do you? I mean, they're no good if they're dead. You can't sell a dead one. You've got to sell them live, right? So, so you lose money. Stephanie's not going to want any dead animals, I'm, I'm sure, right? So, so I think that you have to say to yourself, okay, what, what do I not know? Okay, I, in, in my notes here it says, don't be blind, okay? Ask questions, dig a little bit more research, and I'll tell you what, it's going to make you a better professional by, by knowing a little bit more than just what the media tells you. Everybody watches media and say, wow, is that really true? And how much influence the media has, good and bad, mostly bad, right? I mean, it's, 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 they don't always tell exactly the whole truth. Okay, question back there? Oh, of course, of course. And, and, and some of the big agriculture schools are funded by who? The beef industry. So what are they promoting? They're going to kind of go that side. And so there's dollars, in, there's big dollars involved. So they have agendas. I'm sorry. They, they do. They have agendas because they're paid. It's like a lobbyist paying Congress. They've got agendas. They got, when someone gives you money, they, they kind of want something in return. I mean, I mean, right? Like Stephanie's cattle. She, 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 she are giving them cattle. She wants money in return, right, Stephanie? You want some, you want need some cash back. So nothing's free. Hey, let's, that's the saying of the day. Let's repeat that. Nothing is free. Thank you. Nothing is free. Um, so what I'm going to try to accomplish here, um, the Meat Buyer's Guide, National Association of Meat Processors. This is like put up by the USDA. This is like our Bible. It tells the different cuts. They all have numbers. So you know that a 184 is a sirloin. Uh, but top sirloin butt, okay? I'm going to cut one down if we have time today and break one down and show you what yields are, okay? Most people don't realize, say you have a 1,000-pound animal, by the time you take the hide off and the guts out and, and the bones out, you, you lose about 40%. Does that make sense? And then when you cut into steaks, on some cuts, you lose another 40%. So all of a sudden, that big animal has shrunk down to what? You know, as far as steaks go, what is there? Probably 100 pounds of steak per animal? Is that it? Wow. That's not very much, is it? How many tenderloins? Who likes fillets? I don't. I'm, I'm kidding. I know. Okay. I, wait, raise your hands again. Who likes fillets? Okay. One guy, all the rest were women. Okay. 
See, there you go. Demographically, no, demographically, more women eat steaks, uh, fillets, than men. Men eat the big ribeyes. That's a fact. Um, but there's only two tenderloins in the whole animals. They weigh about five to six pounds before they're trimmed. After you cut them into steaks, you probably get about five pounds of steaks, maybe six, in the whole animal of fillets. Out of the whole animal. Now, that's crazy math, right, guys? Who knew that before today? There are only six pounds of tenderloin in the animal. Uh, hey, real quick, anybody uh, growing up where maybe your parents partnered up with somebody else and they bought a, a quarter of a steer or a half of a steer? Okay, so Corinne, you've done that. So uh, then, uh, then everything comes home and it's all wrapped in, in white paper, right? And it's stamped not for retail, right? And then out of everything that comes in, how much ground beef is there? It's all ground beef. So really what Gordon is saying, when we've got, a, we've got a steer this size, there's only X amount of ribeye steaks, X amount of tenderloin. And for the most part, when we're buying beef like that, about 50% of the animal winds up being ground beef. Okay? So it's, uh, that's just that's the economics of it. Okay? Yep. And you know what's cool about this class here is that you guys have the internet and, and Google. I mean, okay, when I was going to school, I had to go to the library. You probably don't know how to spell library. Okay. okay, okay, I'm being facetious, but you had to go work to get a darn question asked, and it was a lot of work. Believe me, it was crazy a lot of work. So you guys are very fortunate. I'm telling you that right now. Um, never, ever, does anybody know what never, ever means? What's that? Hormones or antibiotics. Can a never ever still have Zilmax? That's one of these little dirty secrets, right? Dirty secrets. Write that down. Dirty secrets. I love it. Question stuff. They use Nyman Ranch. Their cattle are never, ever. I know the program. I used to sell that product. And it is uh, no hormones or, or antibiotics. But they have 700 ranchers that go sell to feedlots. Is Zomax in there? 80% uh, of all slaughterhouses are using it they know of. They, uh, excuse me, 80% of all uh, feedlots that they know of. And if, if you're a damn feedlot, Stephanie, now, now Stephanie just sold her business. Now she's a feedlot instead. What are you going to do, Steph? What are you going to do? You get 20% you get more animal. What are you going to do, Steph? You're, she's a Zomax freak now. Okay? She is hooked on it because she's going to make more. Does money control a lot of things in this world? Whoever says no, you need to leave. Okay. So never ever, um, as I mentioned earlier, I am definitely against growth hormones. It adds 25% to the animal. So in other words, instead of having a ribeye this big, it'll be about that big. It, the muscle structure is smaller, okay? So you get less weight. Costs more to raise them, doesn't it? So when you go to um, Whole Foods or um, Tony's and you buy a steak that says never ever on it and it's smaller and it costs more money, you know why, okay? They didn't pump it up with steroids. It's, it's, it's been treated good. It, it was free range for the first two years, ran around eating grass, and then it got finished in the feedlot. That's the process. Um, like I said, it's not so bad. Question. USA. The retail made a laws a couple years ago that they have to have a country of origin on all meat and seafood products now, which I think is good. So you know that if you're buying beef, it says Canada on it. It's just it's more consumer awareness. It's a little bit of an overkill right now for retail, in my opinion. Okay, a little bit overkill. Uh, and ground meat at King Supers is going to be bull meat and old cow meat. So buyer beware. Yeah, this, well, if it, it, it's more or less likely to be a, all the ground beef is going to be from Canada or U.S. But, but the problem is it's, it could be older animals. Okay, so when you grind, uh, you, when you buy burgers for $1.25 a pound, it's not going to be your best quality. It's going to be head to toe. When you buy ground chuck, 
it's a little bit better quality because you're getting at least whole chuck. You know you're getting this muscle. So, so look for that word on there, ground chuck. That's a good word to look at if you're, if you're buying beef. And flavor. So to clarify, so we can order or buy ground chuck, ground round, ground sirloin. Correct. Or when it just says ground beef? Beef, beef can be anything. Ground beef patty mix can have up to 25% organ meat. It's delicious. Hearts, it's, you know, you grind them up, just some nice red little specks in it. It's actually, we actually sell one cheap burger like that because somebody wants to pay for it. They don't want to pay $3 a pound for ground beef today. Ground beef's more expensive now. Less cattle out there. Stephanie knows, right? So, so, so the industry's changing. The world's changing. Everything changes. You know, we're talking about the economic cycle. So Stephanie has 1,000 cattle. She sends them off to market. She doesn't let any of them get pregnant again to, to calve in the spring, only because the weather report is not good. But then Stephanie decides to get back into it down the road. Well, then she's got to kind of repurchase a herd, doesn't she? She'd have to rebuy the, the, the little calves and then start over again, which she could, but she's going to wait until she gets some grass and so her pond fills back up. That could be two, five years, who knows, right? Um, let me touch base on a couple things here that are economically important since you brought up economics. Corn. Corn is a contributing factor to the cost of cattle. Um, chickens eat corn. Hogs eat corn. You eat corn, right? Who likes corn? Okay, name me some corn items that you probably eat every day. Tortillas. How about corn flakes? Cereal? Who eats cereal every day? Or almost every day. I guess that's old. Uh, so somewhere, somehow, you're eating corn syrup, believe it or not, and, and all your candy bars and whatever. So corn is a big food factor. The government decided to make ethanol out of it. That was not a bright idea, in my opinion. Why is that not a bright idea? Because so, you're driving up your food costs. Supply and demand rule applies to every single commodity in the world. Gas, uh, cattle, hogs, you name anything. Linen, it's, it plays a factor. If the supply goes down, the price goes. If the supply goes up, the price goes. Right. So if McDonald's does a chicken wing now, guess what that does to the price of chicken wings? Because they're going to take a lot of wings. How many wings does a bird have? OK. If you watch football on, on Thanksgiving, John Madden used to make a turkey with like, what, six legs? They really don't have six legs, just to let you guys know that. They only have two legs, OK? Most everything on a cattle is symmetrical, meaning you've got two of everything, two rib eyes, two eyes, OK? So it's basically symmetrical, all right? Um, so what I'm going to do here is break this little guy down. Does anybody have any questions so far? So the basic parts of your animal on that chart is you have the chuck, which makes great burger, great roast. The flat iron comes from the chuck. Who likes a flat iron steak? A fairly new cut about nine years ago. No one's heard of a flat iron? Okay, one guy. One. Okay, there's a flat iron in there. Then you got the rib, which is ribeye, prime rib. Okay, any restaurant terminology does not, it's not in the book. Okay, if you want to call it a Delmonico, it's not in the book. Okay, does anybody understand the difference between a meat terminology and a restaurant terminology? Give me one more example with the tenderloin. Filet min, that's, I guess it was developed in France, right? Sounds French to me, doesn't it? So, so that's, that's not in the meat buyer's guide. Um, so then you have the loin, which is a strip. Okay, the strip touches the rib, and then you have the strip touches the butt. Okay, top butt. That's what we're going to cut up today. I don't have a lot of time, but do you have enough time to do this? Yeah, rip it up, man. Let's rip it up. OK. Uh, oh, yeah, I got a trash. So this is all about showing you the, the visual of yields. I'm a visual learner. And when I see stuff, I kind of remember it. So when you go to King Supers or anybody, they buy box beef. You get four of these in a box, and that's how we sell it and trade it around the world. This is called the top sirloin, top butt. It's the butt. Okay. There's a lot of names in the restaurant in the in the in the meat business. Okay. 
Some are really silly. The pork guy, I guess you guys had the pork guy here, right? Okay, what's the pork, this is a, this is a trick question, but let's see who gets it. What's the pork shoulder really called? I think that's silly, right? Is it the butt or is it the shoulder? Both. It is the shoulder. You know why they do that? Did the guy tell you the reason why? He didn't tell you that? Okay, this is a true story. So years ago, back in Boston, they used to pull out the shoulder and throw it in a stainless steel butt barrel. And it was called the butt barrel. So they said they kind of gave it that name. The It used to be called in retail the uh, Boston pork butt. Then they took away the word Boston. Then it became butt, and that's where it came from, the Boston butt barrel. Unlike the Red Sox. I don't know. I just threw that in there. So I'm going to pull off some muscle. I'm going to pull this muscle off right here. This is called the culotte. It's the cap steak. You probably had that and didn't even know you had it at a restaurant. Has anybody ever known they had a culotte? No. They can call it a sirloin. They can call it a sirloin filet. A lot of people don't call it a culotte. Some, some restaurants do. To me, it's the best part of the sirloin. So I'm going to follow the natural seam on that. See that? I know it's hard to see from here. I'm just going to kind of pull it apart. Again, I used to cut meat like 100 years ago. But I really don't cut meat at all anymore. I just sell the stuff. But Jackson asked me to, you know, cut up some meat. So I said, sure, why not? Okay, so the main thing is, all I'm doing is following that little seam in there. Natural. That's how the animal is made. Has anybody ever cut meat here in this class? A couple people? Good. So you know how to do a sirloin? Hey, wait a minute. Get, get up here. I was going to ask for volunteers. Does anyone want to do this? I see no's. Okay. Chickens. So, there is my culotte. I'm going to trim that up and what I call denude. Does anybody know what denuded means? Take all the fat off. So it's 100% muscle. No fat. I'll do that in a minute. Okay, so now I'm getting closer to the butt. There's a little thing in there called the sciatic nerve. You've got one that runs down your body through your leg. Ever get a little, your leg kind of hurts? Usually that's your sciatic nerve. So this guy has one too. I'm going to trim some of this rest of this fat off here. And, and really, like I said, it's, it's, it's amazing how much it takes to break down beef to get a darn good steak. And people don't realize that, you know, s some people do bad math where they say, well, I bought a sirloin for $4 a pound, and eight-ounce steak is $2. Is that a true answer or not? Bad math, right? If, if you don't cost out anything you make, whether it's computers, cars, or beef, you're going to lose your what? Tail. I was looking for the word tail. We're playing on words here today, guys. Okay, so this meat right here, this is the weirdest thing ever. I don't agree with it. They call this the mouse meat. Okay, so when you grind that up, what do you get? Ground mouse? I'm just, I, what do you get when you grind this up? Ground sirloin, right? Isn't this sirloin? Okay, a little trick question there. Am I making, I'm trying to make you guys, has anybody had coffee yet today? Okay, one, two, I see a coffee cup in the air. So I'm trimming all this connective tissue off. Again, you can see that I'm just having to get rid of all this stuff. All right, we're getting closer, though. It's getting there. Again, I'm not a butcher anymore, so there's that mouse meat seam. See that come off? What's well, cool, a little sciatic nerve in there. If you try to eat that, you'll be chewing for weeks. <laughs> Gordon, uh you probably don't realize it, but you're using the weight of the meat. You're picking up the piece you're cutting off, letting the whole weight of the rest of the roast uh, separate those, those muscles that you're trying to cut between. Yeah. Well uh, done. Yeah, I'm trying to basically get it down to where I can have a nice steak. I, I don't understand the question. <laughs> okay, so there's that little sciatic nerve. You know, I've been known to throw steaks out at the crowd, just so you know, so keep your hands up. 
So I'm going to cut down that muscle right here, uh, the gluteus. There's two gluteuses here. One's large and one's small. So I'm going to cut right down as close as possible. Okay. I'm going to take a little bit of that nerve out of there. It just, it's, it's part of the muscle there. It's hard to get it all out. I can get a little bit of that out of there. Okay. So now, a few years ago, somebody said, well, let's, fillets are really expensive, so let's make a sirloin fillet and let's fool people a little bit because they're stupid. Right? Is, is, is this as tender as a tenderloin? No way. No way. It's good. This is upper choice black Angus, by the way. So I'm using just below prime upper choice. So I'm going to get a pretty good steak. So I'm going to make a little baseball here. Look at that guy. Ooh, look good. She didn't jump too fast. I'll tell you, Stephanie, you're being trouble. So I'll make a little eight ounce full of baseballs. Here we go. Baseball. Gordon. That it actually is in the meat buyer's guide. Okay. It is now a cut in the meat buyer's guide. For years, it hasn't been in the meat buyer's guide. It is now an official cut. So what they're saying is that kind of looks like a fillet, doesn't it? Hard to see there from back row, but looks like a fillet. So, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think people can be fooled as easily now. And when we're done, you can come back up here and look at this and then look at my waist. So... So there you go. Now, I'm going to, ooh, slippery little guy. So now I'm going to face this a little bit. Oh, boy, that nerve is just right there. I can feel it. Anybody want that steak, Steph? She says no. She's a smart rancher. Okay. So now I'm going to make some nice little 10-ounce sirloin steaks, center cuts. I'm going to get a little bit more of that sciatic out of there. There we go. Square it off. Okay, I can probably sell that one. So there's my center cuts. Oh. Okay. I'm just cutting away. Any more questions? Uh, good question. You can make it whatever size you want. You can do an 8 ounce, 6 ounce, 10 ounce. I mean, how much money you got? Okay. Show me the money. Okay, so now I have these nice center cut steaks that I can sell in my restaurant. Okay? Jackson, I did not really portion these out, so don't weigh me. Look at him. He's got the scale out. Don't know. This is a test. This, there's no test here. Okay, so I, so I got a little stew meat. I'm going to have some stew meat in here, but most of it's, I'm either going to grind it or throw it away. If I'm a restaurant, I don't have a grinder. That goes in the trash. Okay, so now I'm going to trim out my culotte, which is my sirloin cap, cap steak. That was about 12 pounds. So I did a pretty good job on that. Uh, what we'll do, Gordon, yes. we'll, we'll run the math here because we, uh, as in a butcher's yield test, we started off with 12 pounds of as-purchased product. But ultimately, we're only going to have about nine pounds that we can use. Uh, I'm going to say maybe six. Maybe six. It, 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 it probably was 12 to 13 pounds. I did not weigh it, so okay. I apologize. But I didn't know I was being tested today. Right? Is this a, what they call a surprise test? What do you call that, Jackson? Uh, pop, pop quiz. <laughs> I didn't know I was getting it. Back in the old days, that's right. Yeah, I, I, didn't, I didn't know I was getting a pop quiz today. Is that legal anymore? Google it. So I think that's, I'm going to pull this cap fat off. And again, I haven't done this in so many years, folks. So, okay. So there's that little fat cap. Most of that's fat. Boom. Voila. Now, you could either roast this little guy, which I think is delicious to roast. Ooh, looks good. Okay, look at that little baby. Does that not look good? Who says looks great? Yes. Sirloin has very good flavor. When it's upper choice, you actually get some pretty good tenderness. So now I can roast it or I can just cut it into steaks. Okay? So, voila, a little culotte steak. 
Um, they might call it a cool up. They're, they're getting smarter. They're trying to copy restaurants because they want home meal replacement. Got a little stew meat. Yummy. So there's your little culottes. Nice. Okay. Make some room here. Okay. What's that? Sirloin. I, you know, they're getting more advanced to take food. They're, retail's trying to take food service dollars away. Food service is trying to take retail dollars away. We're enemies. But typically, 99% of everything you see in a grocery store is junk. Does everybody understand that? Junk. Junk, J-U-N-K, <laughs> junk mail. Um, the way you're supposed to shop at a, at a store is go around the perimeter. Go to the produce department, go to the meat department. Don't buy processed foods as much as possible, and you'll probably live longer and not have as many cancers. I don't know. That's what they say. Does it make sense? Kind of. Is chemicals really good for you? Can anybody out there say, God, I just ate a pound of sodium nitrate today. I feel so good. Probably not. Some stuff you can't get away with. Who likes bacon? I love bacon. OK. If you ever want to convert a vegetarian, cook them bacon. You can now put it on ice cream. So, so but it has a little bit of nitrate, some of them. There is some uncured ones where there are you know, no, no nitrates, which is good. So you have, you have choices now. Um, a lot more than when Jackson and I were you know, in the business and having restaurants and you know, making money that way. So, my, just to recap, because I'm almost out of time here. So what, I, what my presentation was today was really talking about beef, the industry, the, the current events, what's going on with drug problem in cattle. You thought just, some, just Americans had a drug problem. Um, you know, what's going on with the, from birth to box and, and kind of a little bit in between. And hopefully I wasn't too boring so that, you know, you absorb some of the information Again, the parts of the animal are not that complex. There's a chart up there. Just break it down into the simple components. So chuck, rib, loin, butt, round. Okay, round is a leg, butt is a sirloin. New York strip, everybody's had one of those. Everybody's had a ribeye probably. So, so and everybody's had ground chuck probably at least once at a good restaurant. So, so break it down into small components. Don't get overwhelmed with, oh my God, I gotta learn the whole anatomy of this animal. You don't have to. Just understand the basic parts and how it functions and eat, eat them once in a while so you know the different flavor profiles and the textures and how tough one is versus the other and, and how the grading and aging is really important to having a good flavorful quality steak as well as you know, uh, a good, good grade. Um, I don't eat a no-roll ribeye. I just won't do it because you know why? Life is too short, all right? Life is too short to eat a no neural ribeye. Um, we covered economics. We covered corn. When corn goes up, animals go up. So, so you know, I, I try to buy fuel without ethanol. That's almost impossible today, isn't it? Jackson, is there any gas station that serves non-ethanol fuel right now? No, but you know, I know farmers that, that grow corn specifically to sell it to the government. Yep. You know, the last thing they want to do is put it on the open market for us to eat right. because the government is paying top dollar. Yep, it, it's, 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 a, it's actually bad economics. Um, again, politics and lobbyists, somebody got rich off it. Does that surprise you? Would that surprise you if I told you that somebody got rich off this stupid idea? It's amazing that stupid ideas can, can get make fortunes. Gordon, let's do the math on your what's here today. <laughs> okay. So we started off with, let's say, 13 pounds of beef at a retail price of $5 a pound. Okay, so it's costing us sixty-five dollars to bring that big chunk of meat in. Okay, but once you trimmed all the stuff away that's on your yep. right hand side, yep. you really only have about eight pounds left. We've lost five pounds yep. um, in the fat, which will be what do you do with that stuff? Most people would throw that in the trash. You got a little credit on the formula for stew meat because you can use that stew meat. But you, you can come play with this when we're done here and look at it. I'm, I'm, I'm okay with that. So. That's it. Or we'll put it in the fat barrel outside, and it'll be recycled ultimately, right? right. But in the big picture, we only get eight pounds of yield. Yeah. Well, that it still costs us sixty-five bucks in the door. Correct. So you really take your new yield and you divide it by your original sell price. Yeah. And while we think we paid five bucks a pound for this, by the time we get rid of the stuff that has no value, 
our price has really elevated up to seven dollars and twelve cents a pound. Yeah, and I left a lot of stuff on there. So when you trim it up a little tighter, it's actually less. So the more you trim, the more it costs. Does that make sense? Question back there. Um, yeah, they'll grind it. They'll 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 typically grind that. They'll throw it in their potluck. Um, one reason we don't grind that, as I mentioned, it's age. So all the external um, surface area has what? A lot of bacteria. So when you take bacteria and grind it into a burger, you have bacteria in the middle. So it's growing from the middle out. So is that safe? Not really. Because if you use fresh cut meat, like where King Supers gets their animals three days, and you grind the whole animal, there's no back, there's very minimal bacteria, okay? This has maximum bacteria in it. Does that make sense? And once you grind it, that bacteria is now from the outside in the middle of the burger. It's growing. We have bacteria in the air right now. I am breathing your bacteria, okay? I'm okay with that, okay, because it's minimal. But there's bacteria everywhere. So does that answer the question? So I just brings me to the point that I work at a restaurant where we have to serve our burgers to, it's like a medium well, so what is that, 160? Well, 165 degrees. degrees mm -hmm. Because of the bacteria, but then we can serve a ribeye at whatever temperature. Is that why they do that? That's a good question. Uh, why can you get a steak medium rare and not a burger at some places? Like McDonald's, Wendy's, you're lucky if it's not burnt. I go in there. I was at Carl's Jr. I'm going to name uh, last week, and I said, "Don't burn it. I want it made fresh." I'm the bad customer at a fast food. They hate me. They're like, "Oh, that guy's here again. He wants us to do something special." Remember the old commercial? Have it your way, Burger King. What was that? I, any way you like it, we'll make it. Whatever. No, not today. You don't like it? No burger for you. Okay. So I go in there and say, "Hey." I, I want it made fresh, and I don't want it burnt. What? The guy, it took him 10 minutes to understand what I was trying to tell him. I swear, he did not understand. No burnt. So, it, you know, it came out okay. It was edible. But, man, I hate fast food. So, going back to that, these steaks here, man, they don't even smell bad. They didn't have not have a lot of bacteria on them because they were in the middle of the muscle. Okay? So, you can cook this medium rare right now and eat it. Okay, very safe. Okay, this trim does have bacteria. You can grind it, but you better use it in two days. Okay, it'll be bad. Um, uh, 1995, was that Jack in the Box? They, they killed a couple people. Um, when that happened, again, it went from here to over here as far as uh, rules. Uh, anytime somebody dies, everybody freaks out, okay? Um, <laughs> You know, and what I mean by that is they go from, from here, normal common sense, to let's be stupid because um, they decide they've got to cook burgers, all burgers that way. When you're using whole muscle um, and grinding it, you typically have minimal bacteria fresh. So if I took a top sirloin, like I said earlier, and ground it from three days old, man, that baby is as fresh as you can get. It's going to be fine, okay? You can cook it medium rare. I sell burgers you can cook medium rare. We grind burgers that have whole muscle in it. No problem. It's when you get trim, you get old bull meat, you put shank in there, because McDonald's burgers has what? Head to toe, man. You know the cheek right here? They, 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 they take every little piece of meat out of there now and put it in the ground beef. That is a fact. If you've ever been to a slaughterhouse, you'll see the little eyeballs move and the lips move for a while after they cut the head off. Silence of the Lambs, everybody see that movie? Okay, kind of freaks me out too. Don't feel bad. That's the real world though. Hey, you're eating beef? That, that's, that's, that's the truth, isn't it, Steph? The guys do gotta die. A couple questions. You see Cheap. beef sometimes frozen, either in a store or else yep. it comes that way. Talk to the, the issues with freezing beef and holding it and what cuts may be frozen. Um, like everything, you wanna either IQF freeze this in a nitrogen tunnel, which is you know, 180 degrees below zero, you want to be able to freeze it fast, and that's your best way in having a good package. If you have a good package, it minimizes the air migration. I don't care what package it is, you still always have air perpetrating a package because the molecules aren't moving scientifically, right? So it's not 100%. Use it as soon as possible, up to a year, they say. Um, 
when you've got a lot of meat and, and, and you're, it's, going, it's getting old, you either got to cut it, eat it, or lose it. So if you own a steak company, what are you going to do? You're going to either sell it, cut it up and freeze it, or freeze it. So something's going to happen there, otherwise you're going to lose it. So that is a process of the business, and any business, okay? You can't freeze lettuce, I hear. Nobody got that. Okay. Um, Um, right now, because ground beef and, and meat is now exposed to the air, unless I cryovac it, you're looking at three to four days, and this will start to get sour. Once it goes sour, has anybody ever scorched clam chowder? Who has scorched clam chowder or any cream soup? Once you scorch that little baby, there's no saving it. Pitch it. You can add all the cream and clams to it you want. It's still going to taste scorch, right? You know what I'm talking about? Once these go sour, you can smell it, you can see it, it gets a little slimy, they're gone, right? It's see you later, bye-bye. Don't grind it, don't try to serve it, because it's not good. It won't kill you, but it ain't going to taste very good, okay? Gordon, I've got uh, up on the screen behind you um, this handout. Okay. And if you could just, uh, can you talk to this, I know you'll have to put your glasses on oh, for this. Probably for this little. like me. But, can you talk about uh, just some common cuts and, and the concept of load-bearing muscles versus non-load-bearing muscles? I, I guess we all assume the beef business that everybody understands that, but obviously it's, it's part of the genetics of the animal. If I'm standing on my feet all day long, these, these parts of this, my muscle here, what are they going to be? They're going to be pretty either tender or tough. What do you think? Exactly. If I'm running a lot to go get some water every day, tough, okay? The inside of my muscle where the tenderloin lays right in here, what are those muscles doing every day? Nothing. And you know, I don't know how they even got those muscles in there because they don't do nothing. So, so that's why they're so tender, okay? And, and, so, and then you got your leg muscle, which is your round. You know, you have eye of round, inside round, which we call top round or bottom round. And those are all pretty tough. Udi's does a good job of roasting it off medium rare and slicing it paper thin like Arby's. The only reason Arby's is good or edible is because they slice it what? Thin to, yeah, but thin to win. Thin to win. Think about that. Thin to win always. If you got a not so good piece of steak, thinner the better. What you're doing is you're taking that tissue and slicing it. So what's going to be more tougher? This whole muscle or paper thin slices of the tissue. Obviously, you cut against a grain, it's going to fall apart. I love when people go, well, it was so tender, it fell apart. Well, they slice it thinner than paper. What do you expect it to be? Right? I mean, go to Arby's. Is that meat tender? Who said gross? It, it's tender because they slice it so thin. If they use inside round, and they use a gelatin, they bake it, and then they slice it paper thin. If you cut a steak off there and try to eat it, what would it be like? Round steak? In a little gelatin, it would be like you'd be cutting and chewing for a while. Let me just tell you that. So probably not what you want to do. But because they slice it so darn thin, it actually with a little with a little Arby's sauce ain't bad, right? Who's eating their Arby's? Don't lie, don't lie. Raise your hands. Back row, one person really. I I don't believe you. Okay. They're all. She's saying no. She's shaking her head at me, mad. Don't be mad. <laughs> okay, so, um, and there's different ways of serving meats, okay? So chuck, a lot of the chuck, which is the shoulder here, you, you want to braise it. Moisture, uh, low heat, and then just let it deteriorate with the water. If, if, if you cook something for eight hours, I don't care what it is, it's going to be tender, right, guys? It's going to fall apart. So you're going to simmer it to death, okay? Um, and then you got the rib, which is your ribeye. Um, does anybody know what this muscle is called right here? Oh, who, did I do that? I did that. <laughs> I'm like, wow, like the, the power. So, try, try, again. Yeah, try that again. No, didn't work. <laughs> Damn, I thought I had magical powers. I was like, whoa. So, so the little muscle on top of the, the rip. <laughs> okay, now he's just messing with me. Um, it's called the spinalis. It's being seen. Who's eating at Shanahan's? Who has big money? Shanahan's? One person. Uh, they, Gordon, that's a great place to go for dinner when somebody else is buying. 
Exactly. So, so they slice that up and put on a skewer and put a little coleslaw for 15 bucks. But I got to tell you, that's the best muscle. Hey, filet people, girls, okay, the spinalis has actually tenderness and flavor. So it has a ton of marbling. So when you go to a restaurant and say, I want a little spinalis, see what they say. They're going to go, what? You must have gone to school. That's a joke. Come on, you guys. So, so when you roast it, what do you get? Prime? Prime rib. Prime rib. Come on, guys, wake up. Okay, and then you have the loin, which you have the porterhouse at the end, which I don't sell anymore because that's old school. Then you have a T-bone, and you have a bone in New York, and then the tenderloin roast. So, and then next is the sirloin. We talked about that. Okay, who's from California here? All right, you. What's your name? Alex. Where does the tri-tip come from? And don't say California. I don't know. You. See, they're eating something. They don't even know where it comes from. Now, how do you feel about that, Alex? Not good. I, I, I really made her feel sad today. I'm sorry. OK. So the tri-tip, which most meat cutters don't even know this, comes out of the bottom sirloin. So think about this. If you have a top sirloin, where do you think the bottom sirloin comes from? Top or bottom of the sirloin? So below this top sirloin and before the leg is a little three muscles called the bottom sirloin. You have tri-tip, ball tip, sirloin flap. So now, everybody in this class knows where the tri-tip come from. Where does the tri-tip come from? I'm pointing this guy right here. Sirloin flap, tri-tip, bottom sirloin. Let's say that. Ready? One, two, three. Very good. So you learned at least one thing today. I feel like my job was accomplished. OK, so now when you go to that restaurant in California, you say, hey, can I get some bottom sirloin tri-tip? And they're going to go, what? You mean the counter person is going to, or the waitress is going to, waiter is going to go, she knows too much. People do not like educated customers, do they? Carl's Jr. does not like me, OK? I am not good for them because I send it back if it's really, really burnt and I can't eat it, OK? But I don't like dry food. Some people do. I eat beef jerky when I'm skiing, but I don't go out and say, give me a beef jerky burger. So, um, and then you've got your other muscles, your plate, skirt steak. Who loves skirt steak? Love skirt steak. Why? It's in the diaphragm. There's inners and outers. It, it, it's a long, skinny muscle. You ever had a fajita? Some Mexican restaurants, the good quality ones, use that because it's tasty. Skirt steak, awesome. And then you have, of course, brisket, and he's moving it here. And then other meats, ground, stew, cubed. Cube is just a little cuber. King Super sells little cube steaks. You can bread it. Down in Texas, they call it chicken fried. You like my accent? Chicken fried. You can chicken fry anything. Steak, chicken. I don't know why they call it chicken if it's beef. Just kidding. Um, so, so we did cover a lot of stuff, and again, the public is blind. Don't be or blind. <laughs> Let's try that again. The, the public is blind. Don't be blind. Very good. Uh, and and I'm, I'm saying that to you because you all have the tools now to be smarter than us. Even though you may not be, you still have the tools to be smarter. I'm being facetious, OK? You guys have more tools at your disposal. It's so cool. So start asking questions. What is Zilmax? Does anybody know what Zilmax is? Very good. Beta agonist. And what does that do for the stomach? It tells it it's not hungry. Is that a contribu contribu uh, contribution to obesity? Maybe. Who, who really knows what all these things do to the human beings once we eat them for long-term effect? Do you know? Because I don't. Is anybody here a scientist who studies for 30 years? I see nobody. So we all don't know. So therefore, maybe the cleaner foods we eat, the less um, pesticides we eat and ingest, 
is probably better for us down the road. So question? Yes. They, no, the industry is pretty much dead in that. Um, a couple companies that did a lot of that basically um, lost, lost their business. Um, let me explain that a little bit, okay? Because the media didn't over, they overproduced it. Okay, I like a lot of these celebrity chefs. Michael Simon's a friend of mine. Um, I met a couple others over the years, Bobby Flay. But I got to tell you, Jamie Oliver, he over-exaggerated. He took a wash and said, it's like pouring gallons of ammonia into this meat. <laughs> Wrong answer. They, they used just a mist of it. And what it did, they spun the meat off the fat to produce a, a more, less expensive ground beef for schools and that kind of stuff. It, the ammonia dissipates. Uh, um, refrigeration, is a lot of it, old stuff is ammonia uh, in, in, inside there to make it cool. So it's not... It's poison if you just drink a gallon, but it, like everything, it's not as bad as it, it seems. So that's one of those things that I kind of go, you know, it's been FDA approved for, what, 30 years. Um, I think the pink slime got a bad rap. Um, I don't totally agree with it. So, so there you go. But, but the media made you think they're pouring gallons of ammonia. I'm not eating that crap. So there you go. Bad. Um, it raised the price of ground beef overnight. Why? Supply and demand. Less supply of ground beef trim, higher prices. So what the consumer did to itself is it basically said, I'm going to pay more money for ground beef right now. Done. And those days are gone. So, Question for you, Greg. Yeah. You mentioned USA, Canada, Mexico. We have beef in the United States. Right. Uh, I have family in Brazil. And they okay. were ranchers. And they were very uh, disappointed with not being able to bring Brazilian meat into the U.S. market. Politics. Politics. Um, right now, because of less cattle in the United States, I was at Cargill a couple months ago at the harvesting. I could not believe the rows and rows of Mexican beef in Colorado. Yep, up in Fort Morgan. They're up in Fort Morgan. I, I was, that was, if I could say I was one thing I was stunned on, I was stunned that, that there was so much Mexican beef in Colorado. And the problem with Mexican beef Okay, let's look at it. They don't eat corn, right? They, they, it's too hot down there for these animals to marble up. Uh, the, 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 the breed of animals they use is not Angus. So you're getting a big animal that just has no marbling and to me doesn't have much flavor. So, so your, uh, your cheaper restaurants and your, what is that, country buffet, and that's where that stuff is going. So, you know the old saying, there's an old saying, you get what you pay for. Has anybody heard that? Has anybody not heard that? Okay. Is that, is that rule still true? Okay. You know, anything. I don't care what it is. It, it, you get what you pay for. Um, you can get ripped off if you're not smart. I agree with that. But if you're a smart consumer, you can get a good value by knowing what to look for, like we talked about, marbling. When you're at King Supers, get that ribeye with a lot of speckles in it. Because a lot of people shy away from that. They want nice, bright red meat. Ooh, that looks good. Well, not so much. Really, the, the more marble steak is going to be your better, better eating experience. Uh, as far as what? Um, you know, it's a smaller margin. They do more volume, though. And, and, and retail is a different animal. They can sell a sirloin steak for four ninety nine a pound and break even on it. And, and, but they're going to sell you some makeup and some uh, toilet paper. They're going to make 40% margins. So, you know, that's how they make their money. I own Kroger stocks, though, because they work for Kroger. So, yeah, my stock still kind of goes up a little. You know, it's not, not going to make a fortune off it. Um, but it's consistent. So, and, and, and there's an outbreak. So, I mean, Reese's had a big outbreak on potato salad last week, macaroni salad, recall. Is that going to happen more? Yeah. You hear about it more now because it's massively produced. It goes out viral, and everybody in the, in the universe has heard about it. So it's, you know what? You can't keep any more secrets. Um, no, nothing, no, there's no secrets left in this world. So we got like how much minutes left? Two minutes. Um, so recapping again, we talked about a lot of different things. I, I try to include a lot of real-life situations. Here's really where it is. I believe that you, know, you should kind of know a to Z, and, and ask those questions. You know, 
I, I think that that is going to make you a wiser person in this world and, and make positive changes for everybody. So why not, right? Um, any, any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you very much for your time. It's a pleasure to be here.